how we do this, we are the truest, got these fangs super sharp, your shit toothless, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish, in the graveyard, acting foolish, finna dance with the devil to no music, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish. Um, I don't think my voice is capable of doing the, the ghoulish growl. Have you been uh, practicing? I, I actually did. I actually <laughs> did practice and my voice Excellent. cracks. So <laughs> um, this is LP Hernandez here with Max Booth. Max Booth is an author, a screenwriter, small press owner, podcast host, crowd funder, father to Frank, future husband to Lori Michelle. Recent bookstore owner. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. It's a lot uh, of things. I was going to mention something about bathroom with a door to the outside owner. Yeah, that's true. You can see it behind me. Okay. So that's a real yeah. thing. Yeah. I wouldn't and, lie. And we're here today to mostly talk about uh, his book, his recent book, or forthcoming book, Abnormal Statistics, which is coming out through Apocalypse Party at the end of March. Do you have an exact date for that one? I believe it's the 23rd, 23, I think. So is this is this your first collection? Um, I'm saying it is, but that's a lie. Okay. What <laughs> other one do you have out there? Because I have read several of your books, but I've read no collections of yours. Yeah, so the Billy Fields book I had to come out... I was, I believe, 18, maybe 19. It was a collection of stories I had written, and it came out through this Australian press uh, called Newman Books. And the collection was called True Stories Told by a Lyle. And great title. I still stand by that title. I don't stand by the stories in the collection. They will not feel any good. Um, basically, what happened was <laughs> I saw on Facebook, they said, Hey, we're looking for collections. So I sent them an email and I said, Hey, I have these stories. And then like two weeks later, they had printed it as a book without doing any editing or oh, wow. pay me anything. And I mean, I signed the contract, a bad contract, but I signed one and um, they refused to do an ebook because they said it was too complicated. And I don't know why, exactly so it was only a paperback collection and within like six months i kind of felt like i was a bit embarrassed by both the the press but also maybe the collection because i didn't really give much thought into it i was just like 18 and thought oh maybe they'll publish me i'll send them everything i've ever have written in my entire life and that's what they did and they they published it and i had a second collection come out called a also a great title they might be demons and that came out that was 19 or 20 and it's basically a a collection of flash fiction that all take place in the same small town where uh, hell has decided to open up and feast upon the humans i don't think it's great i don't think it's terrible but the uh the, the small press that did it uh shut down and I never felt the need to bring it back. So we can say this is your first good collection. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, anytime okay. I say it's my debut collection, just like imagine I'm saying it's the good it's the good one. It's the one that I'm okay with, with putting out. Because I don't see it listed here with your other books. Or those two are not listed with That's your correct. Other books. Okay. That's correct. <laughs> All right. I've disowned them. <laughs> I don't know if I've said my name out loud to this point, but uh, I'm LP Hernandez. I'm geographically um, convenient to Max Booth. We live, uh, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes away. And so I kind of proposed this as an idea. We met for lunch one day over tacos of interviewing Max on his own podcast to talk about abnormal statistics. So here we are. And um, I did, I read the entire thing 
And I, I do have a question for you on behalf of your friends and your customers. Are you okay? I'm fine. I okay. mean, the pollen right now is kicking my butt, but besides that, I'm okay. Okay. Uh, and tacking on to that, um, I know I, I propose this as a, a podcast interview, sort of a, a reversing the roles a bit, but what I actually do would like to do right now is challenge you to a rap battle. Um, no, I decline. No? I decline. All right. Can't so that's very, top, that's very topical because <clears throat> on the most recent episode of uh, the Ghoulish podcast, talking to Todd Kiesling about mm-hmm. Devil's Creek, you yeah. mentioned that your greatest fear was being challenged to a rap battle. Right. That's so uh, th- that's true. <laughs> a greatest fear as a child, I, I forgot to say. And uh, the joke could have very easily been on me for this because I had no rap prepared. So if you had oh. even a, a, lim- a limerick, I would have I would have been embarrassed. I think it's a safe bet that I would have freaked out like I did. Well, I know uh, I know the the ghoulish intro song off the top of my head. I could do that one, that's but not much song. else. I uh, is that you, Philly? No, that's a uh, Kelby Losack who lives in Houston. He goes by the rap name Heathenish Kid. Pretty good. He's pretty good. So abnormal statistics is your first good collection. Yeah, I think and so. um, we're going to kind of I know most of your um, podcast episodes have a theme. So talking about blank with um, whomever. Hey. And so we talked about I, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is uh, planned or um, happenstance that there is a lot of trauma here. So we kind of wanted to frame this as processing trauma through writing horror. And I think the very first um, story, well, no, novelette. I don't know what the exact word count is. Novella. 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 It's okay. at twenty eight thousand words. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty so, long. So that, um, and that's Indiana Death Song. That's what you kick off the um, collection with. Um, and we talked about that when we met for lunch. But that so well encompasses the theme. I kind of want to save it for the end because I figure we could pretty much check every box just descri- just going over that um yeah novella. that makes sense that's kind of why i included the book because i wrote that novella to be a standalone mm. but at the same time as i finished that with apocalypse we will uh finishing the table of contents because i had sent them a much longer book but then as we were edit- editing it we kind of uh discovered so many of the stories had this theme of family so once we la- la- leached onto that, latched onto that, we it was easy to cut stories from the collection that didn't really fit that. And it, it made sense after the fact to include the novella just because it felt like a like almost like a simile of the rest of the collection. Yeah, it's a, a good lead in. Um and I also appreciate at the end, I, I feel like this is becoming more of a thing lately where you have your thoughts uh, kind of about every story, either what inspired it or just kind of a story behind the story summary. And uh, you did that for Indiana Death Song and he mentioned that it was um, kind of one of the most personal things you've ever written. But um, even the one after that, You Are My Neighbor. Um, and some of these stories are, I think 2011 is the oldest. Which would have put you, what, late teens, early 20s? I would have been 18. 18, okay, so yeah, around the time of your first collection's publication. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really possible I had included the 2011 story in that collection. So You Are My Neighbor. Um, that has some indirect references to what you more explicitly explore in Indiana Death Song. So you have a, a hoarder house. Um, a father who's paranoid about having his oxy stolen and even on the first page it opens with a father choking the main character the protagonist and um, it's presented in first person so you that may be an older story and you may not be kind of aware of your frame of mind when you wrote it so I guess a lot of these stories and you said this a theme kind of evolved um, as you were working with Apocalypse Press how deliberate was the writing of the story? Is it a um, a story device 
I think it gives a lot of buy-in as a reader to have that kind of, you know, um, um, that dynamic between of the of an abusive relationship between the the parents and the the protagonist or the the child in this case. Um, and so you get some automatic buy-in with that, some sympathy on the very first page. You're already rooting for this character. So is that a story device, or is there some more emotional component to it? Yeah, with the uh, the dysfunctional families and how so many of these stories seem to include bad childhoods, it was never something I, I set out to do intentionally. Like, I never thought, I am going to be the guy who writes about bad childhoods. But it's something that my interests tend to go to, especially over the last decade, as I think I tried to find my voice and establish myself with uh, Schultz stories. Most ideas I had would lean to a kid protagonist as and the kid's uh, fucked up uh, life that would typically just be like the auto uh, setup for the story. It wasn't something I gave much thought to consciously or even realize until putting together the collection just how often that came up. Yeah, I was curious about that. Um, I think even reading back, knowing that we were going to speak today, I was going to count the stories that had a dysfunctional family. And it's uh, some of maybe, them, right? Yeah, my maybe one, maybe one off the top of my head didn't. Yeah, um, but for the most part, uh, yeah, I think well, maybe scraps wouldn't, but even so, that includes kids. Um, the one from your hotel experience. Uh, I would say kids. scraps does due to the guys. Uh... Uh, background of why he ended up in prison, although it's not from a kid's point of view. Not, I guess, not all of them. All from a kid's point of view. There's a few of them from like a, a grown man's point of view. So, are you, are you aware of the trauma that you're processing when you're writing? I think you, you might have just answered this a little bit, but no. I mean, the only time I think I've like consciously thought I am going to try to. Uh, exercise some deep dilk shit from my brain out of my head into the page was the opening novella. Mm -hmm. Everything else is not something I really thought about too much. So um, I think you and I may be uh, quite similar in this way. I have a, a short story collection that I wrote when I was younger. I'm not a whole lot younger than I am right now. And uh, I was privilege to get the chance to edit it and re-release it because there was a lot in there that didn't need to be um, out in the public um, but I had a story in my first collection which is called Dreadful the story is called An Inheritance and it's it's one it's pretty long I don't know eight or nine thousand words I think I wrote all eight nine thousand words it's about a um, son coming to reclaim his his father's estate yeah. And I have a, a strained relationship with my father, um, divorced parents when I was five and, you know, kind of saw him here and there throughout my childhood. And I, I think similar to you, I wrote an entire, you know, a longish short story, almost novelette length, not thinking about my dad consciously one time. Yeah. And I go back and read it and it's uh, it's everything that I felt as a child, as a teenager on the page, like um I don't know how, how common that is for you. Is it always in, in retrospect outside of Indiana Death Song that you recognize these elements of your childhood? I'm, I'm sure some of it is plucked pure from memory, like, you know, maybe the oxys or the being choked or something like that. Could be just a straight memory. But yeah. as far as the, the trauma that you're um, working through. I think more recently I've been consciously trying to dig into, like, my past trauma and my memories and just my childhood. Like I'm writing a book now um, about a vampire mom and like the, these brothers who have to reunite. And that's definitely an attempt I am making to write a book about my brothers specifically. 
And I think in the past, I don't think I would have thought, I would have thought that. I would have thought, I'm just going to write something about Brevilds and not even realize I'm just kind of recycling my own experience with my own siblings. So that's something I'm trying to do in the middle of. But I've definitely used just straight memories as like a inciting incident with a lot of these stories. Like, um, I have a Cosmic Fools story in the collection. I'm blinking on the name. But it begins with this kid being led to these dunes by this other little kid. Because he thinks that she might want to kiss him. Mm -hmm. But she's just trying to find is this. The, the, the Lovecraft one? Yeah, what is that called? A disintegration, disintegration is quite... It's quite painless. Yeah. I got to but... give you a shout out to your names. The titles in here are like, yeah. they're nice. Well, thank you. That one is, the title is taken from, taken from some Lovecraft, really. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've never read Lovecraft. I've tried, but I don't like his writing. Um, but the anthology was a Lovecraft inspired anthology. So I was just Googling Lovecraft quotes for titles, and I saw that, and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm, I'm using this. Um, but yeah, that story begins with this this kid wanting to take another little kid to these dunes because it's rumored that there's a uh, cannibal hobo in the dunes. And that's something that definitely happened with me. So I used that as the inciting incident to like get the story going, and I think a lot of them, ha a lot of, most things I write involve some type of real life memory that I've taken and tuned into something fantastic. Like even Scraps, which is about a guy looking a night shift at a restaurant who begins feeding these uh, homeless kids who keep showing up. That was taken from me looking the night shift at a hotel and feeding these two uh, siblings who showed up like every day, like at 1, 2 a.m. hungry, I would feed them. And then my boss got super pissed about it, which happened in this, this story as well. But I uh, did not ad adopt them and then kill on will behalf. Um, so sticking with, uh, before we move on, I want to just, there. Were, so I want to talk about your writing real quick. Um, because uh, my copy of Abnormal Statistics, including um, your very kind, I don't know if you remember what you wrote on here. I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what you wrote to me, uh, we'll keep that between us. You but, can say it. It's okay. Um, all right. So out of context, LP, you can have my pubic hair when you pry it from my cold, dead body. Yes. Okay. I think you're very effective at so some of the the ways you describe your your trauma is very face value and say I wouldn't say minimalist, but I can't think of a better way to describe it. You're not flowery with what you say, but it just it's such a punch to the gut to to read it and to maybe and it might be triggering for some people and it was for me at some points. Like I wouldn't say triggering and like I I had to put the book down. It was more like, oof, you know, something kind of surfaced for me. So. <laughs> For You Are My Neighbor, which is basically a rear window style story, you know, creepy, like something off about the neighbor. It starts off with, uh, and I, I think in your um, your little note on the story afterwards at the end, you yeah. talk about this is something you actually did where you used to break your neighbor's window and it yes. would magically be repaired. Um, <laughs> so a little bit of it, you know, there's something off with the neighbors. Rear window mm -hmm. kind of set up. Is that the right movie? Am I thinking the right one? Rear window? Where... Yeah, I'm kind of disturbia. The seeing someone across the street, and they're. I mean, yeah, I mean, both both of those movies involve seeing the neighbor doing something across okay. the street. Uh, for some reason, I, I think of a car when I think rear window, and I thought it was the wrong movie, so I was I was gonna. Well, be embarrassed. every vehicle has one of those. Yeah, you just yeah, so maybe that's why. <laughs> um. So you have a couple lines in here. Uh. Well, so basically, it's like. Uh, there's something off with the neighbors kind of a story, but you still have a foundation of family trauma. That's your starting point. So I just want to read a couple of these and tell you that these two sentences in particular resonated with me. So, um, so instead he squeezed my face and screamed for something I could never give him. 
like I said, the, it's not super flowery language, but the image yeah. it creates in your mind is such a sense of desperation and such buy-in for this protagonist, this child. And another one, the look in his eyes was the same look he always gave me. It was the only look. Yeah. I, I don't know. It just made me feel a little, I felt a little dead inside when I read that. Um, not that yeah. I experienced that exact, oh, well, <laughs> had, had its <laughs> intended effect, I guess. Um, even if I didn't have that particular trauma, you can kind of put yourself there and maybe some moments that felt the same for you. Yeah. Um, so I think you, um, your, you dedicate this book or your dedication page says, I don't know who this book is for. Yeah. And I think you're, you're going to be surprised at the uh, people that this resonates with because um, we'll get to Indiana Death Song a little more thoroughly and that goes some pretty wild places. But even some of the short stories here in those moments where you capture a trauma in such a, an explicit, you know, sh there's, there's no reading between the lines. It's just out there. And uh, I think that's, it's valuable for people who have even um, have their own kind of trauma to know that they're not the only one. Well, that's good. Um, it sounds like a good thing to uh, strive for. I can't claim that that was my intention because I don't have an intention usually. <laughs> and if I do, I can't recall it now, but that sounds genius. Well, yeah. So yeah. That's, Thank that's you the point for I was making getting it to. sound this good. <laughs> so you know and, and a lot of the stories uh they kind of go off in you know different directions um yeah. and you are my neighbor kind of takes a, a left turn um and then the following one blood dust uh and i'll have to circle back and just i know i, I said it briefly just moments ago but you have some pretty cool titles in here i just have to give you props for those like blood dust uh, I, I i couldn't really picture it but i was like man it's really intriguing it makes you want to when you stop at the end of uh, your army neighbor and you start you're like blood dust is the next story. Like what the hell is that? Yeah. To me, blood dust is like, you've been crying so much that blood is just now coming out, but like you'll discover well, most, most of these titles, I've just stolen them. This one is from a song by Modest Mouse called a uh, wild pack of family dogs. And yeah, there's also, yeah. there's also, there's a pilt in the song. Well, it said something about crying blood dust. I thought that's a great that's great. I'm taking it. You did uh cop to that um yeah. towards the end and your little uh in your um notes about blood dust. It really uh, much is just an adaptation of that song. I mean the song walks through most of the things that happen in the story. And, and then you follow that up with fish, which you have a one sentence explanation for. <laughs> oh no, two. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I uh Maybe a little light on the family trauma there. There is still, uh, I would say, a, a young, an adolescent. Yeah. Maybe going it's through about, some things. It's more about making a family in a really fucked up way, I guess, than an already established family going through a dysfunction. Uh, I appreciated the note on that one. So um, if it's awkward the next time we meet, it's just because I know that about actually the entire world. Potentially, yeah. whoever reads this book is yeah. going to know that about you. Oh, that's fine. I mean, how does that, I've already, how does that feel? I mean, after Indiana Death Song, it doesn't matter. I mean, I I imagine folks will be gifting me uh, ice buckets for Christmas. Yeah. Um, you can keep the one that you borrowed. Oh, I, I, I rinsed it out. Oh, in that case, I'll take it back. Okay, so. cool. I hope he didn't rinse it too thoroughly. No, <laughs> I'm not uh, wasting waddle. So, <laughs> and in in this, you have uh, stories from, like I said, you were 18 at, at the youngest, maybe when you wrote. Yeah. Up until. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, as well as, do we include a strilly in that called Mad by any chance? A zombie mm -hmm. strilly? Uh, okay. There was a there was a zombie esque story. Uh, besides the uh in the attic of the universe no i think i no. cut it at the last second yeah then 18 would be it i did have a story that we were gonna include called mad that i wrote when i was 16 as a uh, a science report in school 
And but we I cut it because I didn't think the writing was good enough. Were you uh, tempted at all to edit any of these to like your current writing prowess? No, we did some editing just for typos and a few awkward sentences, but the uh, most of the previously uh, published stories I uh, left as they were published. I didn't want to go through. It seemed like too much work to do. So, and I am I think I texted you this after I read it, um, sent you um, a picture with some stuff underlined and WTF next to it. But I also said, um, I can see the, you know, the progression from an 18 year old Max to yeah. someone who was, has more found their voice now. So um, I think that's a good thing to see for your readers. Like this was what you were capable of producing at 18 and yeah. Now you're or thirty. You're still way younger than me. Thirty. I'm, 20, I'm 29, twenty-nine until July. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so a decade later, the stuff you're writing, and um, I guess the 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 choices you make as a writer. So um, I thought that was pretty I, fun to see. I definitely definitely wanted to include at least one story from like tw the 27, 2011 Ilya because I had a shit ton of stories come out around then. Most of them not great, but I mm. stand by the uh, one zombie story that's in it. And is that mostly, in the attic of the universe? Yeah, that okay. one. I, I still think it's pretty good. Um, and that kind of just came from like reading like Stephen King collections as a kid mm -hmm. and like being able to do the same thing you just said, uh, like progress, like, well, he wrote this at this age and then so forth because a lot of his collections, especially the, like the Phil's two or three, they span several decades worth of time. I okay. always thought that was neat. Yeah. Um, so the, the stories themselves are taking place in different eras or, Oh, the publication dates. I'm sorry. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 fun to see. Um, it's fun to read your. Uh, I'm sure some of these stories you probably hadn't read or thought about them for, you know, a decade or more. Like some buried deep in your hard drive and and kind of revisiting them, seeing where you were. At, you were in, still in Indiana at that time. I'm guessing. No, I moved when I was 18. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got the hell out of Indiana as soon as I had good. Was San Antonio the first choice or? I moved to Texas just because I knew a bunch of a few people from writing websites. And so I thought, well, it's a good place as any. And I began living in some random guy's kitchen for a while. That was a friend of a friend. And then I got a job stocking groceries and got a, a studio apartment and so forth. Did they give, like, when you crossed the state, did they give you your gun when you crossed the state line? Yeah, yeah, I sold it. Okay. You sold it? Okay. Yeah, some, no, that's bad joke. But yeah, I sold it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's your podcast, so you can cut it out if you want. That is true. All right. Um. So all of those stories, you know, and, and uh, without, being spoiler report we're going to talk about even the the last uh let's see what is it called you the list of i'm going to say this wrong i'm going to try attempt to pronounce it familicides sounds good okay, yeah. okay. in the united I've, states by decade. i've been saying it as familicides which i think okay. is how you said it yeah i mean yeah i haven't i haven't like contacted the professional to confirm how to say it but that's how it sounds I'm going to have a, a moment of vulnerability with you since nobody's going to hear this. Okay. Uh, I had only ever read the name Penelope. I'd never yeah. heard it pronounced. So the first time I said it out loud, yeah. I said Pe Penelope. That's how it looks. That's how it looks. So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you even tie in the Indiana death song, put a nice little bow on the whole collection. And um, it is a bleak i can't say it another way it's a bleak collection but sometimes i think you need that um there's not a lot of hope i would yeah yeah um but it, it's i think what what you might generate out of that is commiseration 
So I do want to shift over to Indiana Death Song now, which is an 80 plus page novella written in second person as the introduction to your short story collection. And I'm going to ask, ask you to say, explain yourself. I had, I think I <clears throat> fucked up slightly with having that novella, which isn't, which is in second person directly uh, precede uh, You Will My Nabel because someone who read the book didn't realize that the story had changed and they were like, man, this kid is going through some fucked up shit. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's so, a... I mean, yeah, it's... I guess you could see how it's the same kid a little bit. Yeah. Like the, the, the father's still kind of fucked up and You Are My Neighbor. So could be a little carryover from the first... Or from Indiana Death Song. Yeah, both have opioid stuff going on, so I do see how that could seem like it's the same kid. Maybe it is. I don't know. I don't think... No, it's not, but anyone could believe it if that's what they want to believe. What was the question? Um, I just... No, it was more I wanted to commend you on your brave choice to oh. start a, a short story collection with an 80-page novella written in second person. Yeah, that was a pain in the ass. <laughs> so why did you choose any you, you talk about this at the end uh you know that this is something you've attempted to write before yeah uh, why did you choose this format and this collection for it it wasn't my my feels choice i mean i tried to write this thing many times and it always just wasn't right and i would stop and rewrite it again and again and it was just going to be a novel at one point, a, a non-genre novel, just like almost like a, like a memoir auto, type. Yeah, but like as fiction still, but nothing genre related. Um, but it was always really tedious and billing because it's about a kid who lives in a hotel and nothing happens. Um, so I found that difficult to uh, to get excited about. But once I realized, like, oh, wait, maybe there's a way to add a, a spookiness to it as well and make it a genre book, that when, that's when things begin to, to change up. And I'm not even sure how much I should talk about with the genre aspect because it's kind of like halfway through the book and it comes as a surprise, I think. So it's difficult I haven't really talked about it on a podcast yet, so it's difficult now trying to decide what I should and shouldn't say. Anyway, so I added that aspect to it, and I was still struggling to, like in outlines, to decide what to include. And that was because I was still trying to be like stubborn about making it a, a novel. But once I realized that it could just be a novella, that kind of opened up some freedom that I didn't have to keep stretching it out. And then um, I still found it a bit difficult to write because I was trying to write it in, in Phil Pilsen. And because a lot of the events in the book uh, happened to me, I don't know. It felt like it was a bit too much, but once I, thought about maybe detaching myself completely from the kill tool and speaking and writing it in second person instead, it just began flowing so naturally because it was no longer me just saying like, well, this happened to me, this happened to me. This was, it was now me telling you this happened to you. And for some reason that was just like really freeing. I found. Have you thought about the the psychology of that at all? Like writing it first person versus second, and why one felt easier no. than the other? No. What do you think? Uh, I think you need to talk to somebody about that. I'm talking to you. Okay. Um, I am not qualified, but that's okay. I, it's a uh, it's an interesting choice. You know, I had to. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is second person, but I'm going to Google it before I talk to him. <laughs> yeah and it is um well it, it i mean without sp spoiling too much it does go a a bit experimental with that second pills and as the story progresses and once i realized i could do that i mm. was really excited i was i was giddy i was going around the house going guess what i thought <laughs> i could do this <laughs> 
so, and I have a lot more to say and ask you about, but um, sticking with kind of the theme of processing trauma, did you, was there, what did you feel like kind of when you typed the end to that one or the last period, did it, did it feel like you had been through something or? Yeah, okay. I was pretty re relieved because I had been trying to write about this from 15 on rule, all my 20s. And never succeeding. So I was really happy that I was able to finally get the hotel book out of my system before ending my twenties because I was like a like a like a goal I had. So I wouldn't continue dragging this long. It felt like okay, I can just drop this now and I'm done with it. Although of course when you do a book like this, you then have to talk about it on podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I've I've doomed myself. I think, and maybe it's like that. I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm peripherally aware of of like Scientology and what they do, and they kind of make you go through the experience over and over again until I'm not advocating for it. I'm Are you trying to recruit me? <laughs> Actually, that's my. If you would like to come down to our center, we can yeah. talk about this more. No, it's um, a it's Elizabeth Moss going to be present because I will I will join you. It's gonna be uh in the dark. So you cannot see that. Yes, it is her. I'm game. <laughs> and that the 70s show, she's also as well. She'll be there. Who, who, which one's that? The redhead. Oh, is she? Yeah, I think Interesting. so. Uh, um, but yeah, I think there's something too, not that I advocate for that um, at all, but just exposing yourself to um, the, the trauma that you've kind of shared with the world at this point um it maybe takes it maybe blunts the, those kind of sharp edges of it yeah um, i know rereading and, and hearing my old work which has some of my old uh the stuff i was working through and maybe not realizing at the time um it's like i got it out of my system and i think i'm not sure if you posted it on twitter or where that i saw you you had a, you met with a therapist and then never I came did. back that's correct. I uh, okay. I did an appointment like two months ago, and I thought, yeah, this is this could be okay. Made a follow up two days later. I went, nah, nah. Cancel that. The, I, I think I'm in the same boat in that. Yeah, I could I could definitely see the value of it, and um, I don't at all like I, I encourage people to do it, but I feel like I spend a couple hours every day writing mm -hmm. the stuff. I almost like it's kind of like. I almost like journaling, you know, but you frame it in a fictional format. So I have a lot of dads who weren't present in my stories and um, it's, I don't know. I, I hate to use the word therapeutic because I feel like it's a bit overdone with writing. Yes, it is. Obviously it's therapeutic. You're yeah. pulling something deep out of your subconscious and um, processing it by creating maybe someone that, uh, in your scenario or whatever trauma you experience, they, they succeed or they overcome and you kind of live vicariously through your own um, keyboard. I think sometimes I agree with everything you just said, but expanding on that, I think sometimes it also just helps to like, if something did happen to you and you've never told anyone, well, if only like close, close family members knew about it and it was kept secret it does help to talk about that. And what, what better way to shield that memory than to write a story about it and let people read it as fiction instead, because you, you do kind of have that slightly less like embarrassing detachment to it. Well, this didn't happen to me. It happened to the scale tool and you can read about it. I think that might be something to that as well. Has anyone ever recognized themselves in your stories and told you about it? No. Okay. Um, the closest thing I can think to, which is not quite this, is my novel, the uh, my novel, the Nightly Disease, which is about working the night shift at a hotel. Um, a few of my my co builds at the time at the hotel read it, and they were like, "Is this me?" And I always had to lie and say no. And the other question they would always ask me because in the uh, the novel 
the the guy, the night audit little guy, he frequently goes up to the roof and uh and jilks off and comes on the vehicles below. And they would ask me, uh, do you do that? <laughs> so I would always say, yeah. <laughs> okay. So well, that, that... Uh, uh, jerking off in a hotel is a nice segue into yeah. uh, talking a bit more about Indiana Death Song. I think so. <laughs> All my All right, life, so... I have been jilking off in a hotel. You will just get full tits. Okay. So um, <laughs> I don't know if we were. If we'd solidified our StokerCon plans, but I'm, I'm canceling our room together. I'm not going to StokerCon. And I haven't booked a room. That's comedy. I should have called it StrokerCon because we're talking <laughs> about... <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try and stay away from... You, you mentioned this is genre, so I'll stay away from what I feel the elements that you might want to preserve as a surprise for your readers. But... Um, so... As I kind of touched on before, you know, in your um, dedication page, you say, I don't know who this book is for. And, yeah. you know, you and I are, whatever lives we've led, we're very, I don't know. I don't know you well enough to say we're different people. We may be more similar than not. But um, I, a lot of that resonated with me. And I think you might be surprised in the feedback you get. <clears throat> so I'll just fixate on a couple of things. Okay. That um, the Truman Show Syndrome. Yeah. So. I think that, you know, when they talk about what movies were uh, traumatic that didn't intend to be, I think The Truman Show was a, a deeply damaging movie in a lot of uh, a lot of ways. That, I think so. Yeah. So what was that like nine, late 90s, 97, 98, somewhere around there? Definitely the 90s. That's when Jim Keeley was king, right? Yeah. 90s. So. Um. And I would, I hope the audience is familiar enough that we can just kind of talk around it, but oh, we um, can, I have no problems with spoiling the Truman show. If you haven't seen it. Oh, well. Okay. So uh baby raised in a, um, a basically a town sized movie set as a reality television. So everyone around him, they're actors and uh, in his, um, adulthood begins to notice kind of the patterns and the fact that he can't leave this place and it's a I guess on the surface comedy but when you're a 13 year old kid living in a hotel in Indiana strung out parents and a lot of time on your hands I think actually let me pull a a quote real quick so same thing you know I talked about uh, your writing and how you can communicate these these ideas that just are so is form a, a pit in your stomach and it's not that you went some crazy I guess almost uh, like Cormac McCarthy style like it's you just chose to say it in the right way that um hurts to read so yeah I, I underlined it I mean it may not be able to find it right now but oh so it's when you're talking about so this is the you character because this is second person so you've been in at this hotel, <clears throat> what was supposed to be kind of a a uh, short term thing, a response to the roof caving in in your actual home. So yeah. this is always has the I think from the parents' perspective, this is always temporary because we're not a uh, we're not a hotel family. This is right. until this is until dot dot dot. Mm-hmm. But the thoughts you have as uh, and you're pulled out of school. You don't know where this is leading. You don't know if you'll ever go to school again. You don't know if there's a future for you beyond this hotel. Like, man, that feels just so hopeless, so isolating. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, um, it was extremely uh, hopeless because, I mean, time moves really slowly as a little kid anyway. But in that exact situation, Bill, you don't really leave. You don't talk to anybody. It felt like a hundred years, you know, like you think I'm just stuck in this place for the rest of my life. And it's like, it's kind of that, like the curse of the summer where every day is a day off. Like the, yeah. I'm sure that there's a, an initial like, oh, this is different and, and maybe even fun or cool. And then it's like, you know, I think your childhood time pro- processes differently. Mm-hmm. And so you fixate 
on like your character, the the you character fixates on the Truman Show and the Girls Gone Wild um, yes. preview that he has memorized. And now just the text of the girls, maybe it's just the font of the Girls Gone Wild preview that uh, gets him excited. Yeah. So there's all these, you know, it's such a scaled down universe, very much like the Truman Show, that it's it's almost it's more than believable that you can find yourself thinking that this is happening to me. Yeah. Like, and so you uh, like have these questions: Why are like what kind of a show am I giving all of these people? I'm just uh, this, this cannot be entertaining. <laughs> abusing this ice bucket yeah um, and the I original think... ice bucket challenge <laughs> did, you, um, did you raise any money no okay did you uh, uh, well um i don't know how to answer that question <laughs> okay. but i never did the ice bucket challenge but i was uh 18 19 years old i had an apartment in lubbock texas mm -hmm. i was a a donut fryer that worked overnight I had a couch, a TV, yeah. and a mattress on the floor. So it was uh, kind of that same, uh, not the same scenario. I was, you know, uh, technically an adult um, living on my own, but that passage of time. And so like what you did with your time, and in this case, this, uh, the you character um, researches Wikipedia pages with like, you know, of goes down the rabbit hole of like uh, family annihilator scenarios. Yeah. And I was, you know, at the same time um, looking at, I guess, whatever kind of came after rotten.com, like some of the more. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was a rotten.com kid, but I don't know what came after that. So there, there were more like message boardy type that were worse. Okay. okay. Um, I, I'm forgetting the name of them offhand, but like, it's a, a horrific existence of the same thing as a night shift worker i didn't see people so i slept during the day yeah and there were maybe a handful of people in the in the grocery store i worked in so you'd see two three people a day and then <clears throat> sleep when it was light out and so you're exposing yourself to all of this i don't know maybe that's just kind of the human condition you go there for lack of anything else to do yeah so, i think so um i think that you people are that is going to resonate the the um truman show aspect of it i'm i'm not convinced i'm not in the truman show that's a i mean truman show syndrome i discovered is just a real like syndrome i mean because of that movie specifically a lot of people have gone on to get to have these pale annoyed delusions that i have cameras while watching them it's fucking nuts what is that... movie has had that type of a like effect on people i don't know did that feed into the gang stalking idea where people think that kind of people are out to get them and that they're being followed and stuff like that i don't know okay well i'm going to send you down another rabbit hole like after we finish look up gang stalking there's very okay sad people that believe uh, the government or whomever are following them taking stuff out of their trash can and just hmm. um Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, I just I didn't know that's what it was called. Um, I don't know if that's related to the Truman Show uh, thing or not. I, I just maybe it's a sense of self importance too. I don't know. Yeah, like you're you're the star of you know, you're so uh, you know worthy of the government's attention because whatever reason right. or worthy of being the the centerpiece to reality show. Yeah. Um. So the same thing. I was I, I would kind of you know because there's that scene in the truman show where he's got the bar of soap and he's drawing the uh was it like the astronaut helmet around himself and then he kind of winks at the mirror yeah that sounds like, right it's been a minute since i've seen it so i think that's when he's realized like when he's uh that's before his his boat trip uh um, yeah where he fi finds the borders of his world and he gives him like a little wink i think and says mm -hmm. that one's for free or something like that <laughs> I found myself doing that. Like, yeah, like there must be some code or something I can say somewhere I can look and kind of, you know, give a little wink and let people know that I'm in on it. Like, right. 
my whole thing was I began trying to, like he does, I guess, disrupt the production. Like sometimes I would audibly announce I was going to uh, commit suicide, or, like sit on the edge of a yeah. window and say, I'm going to jump. Is anyone going to come out? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, you spend so much time isolated, your brain really goes into some crazy places. I wonder if that, I mean, like silver lining is that inspired the creativity that's, you know, made you the writer and creator you are. Like you've had maybe, you three, yeah, it was 13 through 16, right? That you were there. Yeah. Was it the same hotel the entire time? No, that was something I uh, decided pretty quickly. That was also tripping me up trying to write the book because we would go to many different hotels. Okay. But if I wanted to establish a, especially the uh, the genre aspect of it, it made way more sense just to keep it restrained to one hotel. In reality, there's no way they would have been able to afford to stay at the casino hotel because they only give you a few comps and that's it. And they would have to pay the rest of the time. And the hotel by the casino would be way too much money if you only want to stay at long term. So we would stay at that one. We would stay at the... Uh, the Super 8 Hotel is one we say that a lot because they would give us a pretty uh, pretty uh, cheap uh, monthly rate. And really, it's had little hotels around northwest Indiana. Sometimes we would go and stay with uh, my grandmother a little bit. That didn't last long. Too many uh, hostile uh, arguments between uh, my mom and uh, my grandmother and my, uh, my brother who was living with my grandma at the time. So we eventually just stopped going ill completely. Um, so the the uh, casino aspect was pretty true to like your yeah experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your deal with teeth? I don't know. I um, my whole uh, I don't really have anything with teeth, but. My, your, uh, my social your... me my social media thing is give me your teeth. Yes. But that's just from a uh, a joke from a, a cracked.com column I read like a decade ago. It's um this this comedian Sean Baby, he had a column about like the uh the creepiest mascots and fast food. And he had this whole thing with the the BK King. Uh, creeping over someone watching them sleep and like the joke was the person woke up and said ah what are you doing and the king said you've been dead for six hours give me your teeth and for some reason that has made me just laugh so much whenever i think about it and when it was time to create a social media thing well, just for twiddle only i guess that was on my mind at the time so i just wrote that and the whole teeth thing with um Indiana Death Song. I can I guess we can talk about this. It it begins, the novella begins with uh someone from the casino supposedly committing suicide off the uh perky, the Pilking Garage roof. And then um the kid goes to the scene where he uh landed and finds a bunch of his teeth and begins sucking on them for reasons that didn't make sense when I was writing it and make less sense now that I, I think about it, but it, it felt right for some reason. Um, I don't know. I just, I always had this image of someone having like a jawbone, someone else's jawbone inside their mouth, but I don't know enough about how jawbones will look and how big they might be feel it to have made, to have written about it with any confidence. So I just made it loose teeth instead. So I actually, let me see. All right. So, <clears throat> yeah, I was confused. Yeah. But when I when I read it at first, and I think it was maybe that was the the WTF thing I sent you. I'm not sure. But you actually did make it make sense. So I'm going to read the part that I underlined that made it make sense for me. Um, okay. Earlier, earlier in this story, um, you talk about, you know, uh, what was it? Uh there's a movie in your Xbox. Anyway, regardless. Oh, yes. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Okay. So yeah. your Xbox has been in the uh, 
uh, pawn shop. Yeah. However long, and you have thoughts about like, is the DVD still in there and, and different things. So you kind of plant that seed um, about, I, I don't think at this point, um, kind of when the teeth thing starts, I don't think the, the circumstances surrounding why you were in the hotel, in the motel or the hotel yeah. why that's if that's been revealed yet um, but it, it is later and so you have this line <clears throat> um, the tooth once belonged to someone else and now it belongs to you you're used to it working the other way strangers owning what what you once possessed so for that made it make sense for me I, like i was like oh okay at that point it's fucking gross but it yeah. made sense and you go further down the kind of genre and the explicit aspect of it. And uh, you talk about like, you thought it was uh, improper to wash the blood off because, you know, that was like yeah. kind of treating it like a museum item. And so um, I, I, I was wondering, is it just going to be a thing we're going to have to accept like that you're a, a tooth sucker and yeah. <laughs> And if then I, I'm happy to suck on anyone's tooth at any signing. Just bring it to me. So say yeah. my la my last question. That, that that's gonna <laughs> but reading that it was like, yeah, this character who and you kind of touch on it with I think um the following story, the you're my neighbor, you know, the out of control father who forgets that they've sold things and They've already pawned the thing that he's looking for to sell. Yeah. So this is a kid who, you know, ha has given so much more than he's received that he gets this little bit of this person, this suicide victim. And there is, a, you know, a little bit of um, kind of speculative stuff that happens when he sucks on the teeth and yeah. uh, on others' teeth. <laughs> but this is a really confusing novella to talk about. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I promise it'll make sense um, yeah. for anyone who reads it. And it's also like you, you say in here, every tooth tells a story. So your, your character has, um, you know, the, it doesn't just end there with him sucking on teeth that, that does things for him. So um, when you're, you're you character, when you're the, the, the protagonist sucks on the teeth, he gets like glimpses of this person's life. It becomes an addiction kind of for yeah him. and uh it equal parts disgusting but then it feels like you're almost rooting for the character because now they have something other than coming in ice buckets and like they have i yeah. guess something <laughs> worth living for yeah teeth uh teeth. well not just teeth but uh really uh living someone else's memories and having like a pilpus even if that pilpus is strange and doesn't really seem to have a point to it, but it's something at least. It's something new. And it gets, I mean, pretty graphic, like him um, sucking teeth on the carpet and uh, as as gross as it was, and I'm saying gross as like, I'm guessing most people are going to find it gross. I didn't particularly find it gross. I was like kind of smiling as I read it. Well, but teeth considered also, gross? Is that a thing? A dead man's teeth, maybe? or a, <laughs> Good point. Valid a, point. <laughs> um, that, you know, it's... I found the uh, scene... This is my tryptophobia coming through, uh, where your the mother character was, like, pulling the metal shavings off of the father's back. Yeah, popping them, out, like, popping them out of his skin like a pimple. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to like, I, I start to like, uh, ball yeah. my hands in the fists when I, I think of stuff like that. I just get like yeah. an image of holes on his back, and that was harder for me as like a, a my gross yeah. tolerance. The teeth thing actually made sense at the end, and okay. um, I think as bleak as it was, that um, I hope when he start getting feedback for this, and especially for Indiana Death Song, because you know it is. It is kind of the centerpiece, and I'd say it's the star of the collection. All of the stories are entertaining. They, you know, from a little more uh, gross but fun, like with fish, and uh, yeah, I think what was that story where they was that story where they 
the uh, two kids lead the other kid and kind of bludgeon oh, him. Yeah. For the nasties. Is that based on that story from England? It is, yeah. Okay. It, it's uh and that comes kinda... that comes from like as we were discussing, like living in a hotel and we'll just living without any anything else going on in your life, like just looking at the grocery store maybe, and reading like all those like Wikipedia pages of like true things that have happened. I mean, that was one of them. That case at Jamie Belgel. I was obsessed with that for a long time until, you know, thinking about it now, until I got it out of my system by writing something about it. I, I think for me, um, maybe you and I went on the same journey and weren't aware of it at the same time, but seeing on those uh, websites, like the worst thing that can happen to somebody, it, it obviously makes what you're going through not so bad in comparison. But yeah, I think, I think for me, it's always like, if I know this is the worst thing that can happen, at least I'm prepared. Like I've seen it. I've seen the worst thing, worst thing humanity can do to another person. And so if you ever find, you know, in those one in a million chance you're gonna find yourself in an experience like that at least it won't be a surprise right that sounds wise no well, thanks sounds you. like a sound uh, if anyone asks like gives me that question in the, the future that's what i'm gonna say okay <laughs> so um i don't know what's probably we've been talking probably about an hour now so i should start to wrap it up um i'm I will not rap. Uh, rap. I st- uh, I've got the ghoulish song. I'm ready to go. Are you listening to music as you talk to me? No, but uh, if you want to have a rap battle, I'm ready to throw it. I am not ready. I, there's, right. no, there's no uh, being ready. <laughs> I'm going to have to write a story to get this out of my system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <a> battle rap. <right? laughs> um, since you made me go through the visual of the... Uh, pulling or scraping metal out of someone's back, I can maybe make you uncomfortable in thinking that anytime we meet, a rap battle might happen. <laughs> you will never see me again. I'm going to talk to, your, uh, to the other folks coming to uh, the Ghoulish Book Fest and we're going to get you like in the center of the group. I am banning you from the convention. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's something my mom used to do to my dad all the time when he would get home from uh, his job. Just pop those p- fucking things out of his back. Disgusting. Yeah. She loved it. She she had a, a. I think she had like a popping fetish or something. Yeah, because she would she would go like to all the kids, and if they had any type of pimple, she would be like, "Oh, let me get this." She she enjoyed popping flesh. I know that's the thing. I just uh, I, I can't see my hands, but I'm like. I'm digging into yeah. the palm of my hand right now. It, it's just, yeah. I don't know what, what it is. It's gross. I agree. It's disgusting. I, well, I'm, I'm gl- with you. I'm glad. Yeah. So um, the next time we meet, uh, either at Ghoulish or sometime before then, if we go get tacos again. We should. If I give you a tooth, one of my teeth, yeah. What what are you capable of telling me about myself? I don't know. I don't know if you have to be dead or alive. That's the thing. Well, I guess we I guess can... we're going to find out. Yeah. Uh, a lot of this novella, I did not spend a lot of time thinking uh, about the uh, like logicalness of this logicalness. That's not the rule, is it? I don't know. The logic of the, the plot it was definitely definitely something I just I wanted to coast on with just vibes. Mm. Just this, this one like helpless feeling of of dread and ho- of hopelessness and so talking about it now and like trying to describe the plot to a few other people and plus also i'm in the process of uh, writing a screenplay uh version of it it's really funny to me because it's just insane the like when you actually strip it down to just plot it mm. doesn't make a lot of sense and it's kind of insane I had a my two word review is relentlessly heartbreaking because I, like I, I don't know why, but I did feel for that protagonist that, you know, you you you're so upfront with all the, the the bad circumstances that you can't help. But feel for them, 
then, you know, as you're presenting them, I don't feel uh, any kind of way that someone's, uh, you know, coming in an ice bucket and has all these other weird um, eccentricities about them. I just ended up feeling really sad, but also like, damn, I've been there before. So I think you're going to find that as this gets out in the world. I think, I mean, I'm not trying to sound too egotistical, but I do think this novella specifically is really good. I think it's the best thing I've written. And I do think because I was mostly trying to capture that feeling instead of that, that emotion, instead of coming up with a, like a, like a story. And I think because of the, the second Pilsen POV, that's why it hits like it does. I think, because it, I think it feels even more hopeless being told that way, but I can't quite describe why it's just like you're being told this thing from an outsider's point of view. And it sounds like it's predestined almost when it's through mm-hmm. second person. Well, I mean, you might um, find without giving like a, from that first person perspective where you might have a character description as second person, you're kind of putting yourself there. Like the reader is, I'm imagining yeah. a 13 year old me in that hotel room. And uh, yeah. So I, I think as a, as a choice, it was effective. It was disorienting. Um, to start off with and then like with any engrossing story you you kind of that falls by the wayside as you you start to invest more in the story so it was uh you know I I kind of pictured myself going through your um fucked up childhood I guess or teenagehood nice got him I got you that's my goal (laughs) so so get you anyone who reads it I hope I get you (laughs) Um, i uh i think opening it was probably opening the collection with it is probably the right decision it's something we thought about a lot and we also could have ended it with that but my whole mindset went back to uh stephen king collections mm -hmm. because i mentioned i liked how you know with his collections you can see the the different publication dates expanding quite a number of yields but also in his collection, Skeleton Crew, he opens that collection with like one of his best novellas of all time, The Mist. Mm-hmm. I always thought that was a pretty courageous decision just to open this collection with a long ass story, knowing you have all these other stories coming after that. So that was kind of my, that helped me make the decision to open it with this. Well, it's uh, like you said, your best writing. Um, based on what I've, I've read out of yours. So you kind of like, um, you know, I don't know. It's like put your, uh, I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words here. I apologize. But oh, that's okay. it, de- it definitely does, uh, in addition to it being well-written with all those moments that like, I, I swear, I probably have 50 different, maybe, I don't know, 75 different lines highlighted um, that, it does kind of set the stage for the rest of the collection as well. Um, read, read them all. Read every highlight. That's oh, amazing. It's really oh, no, strange. I, I could. Um, no, I mean, some were like, you know, just uh, would like to frame the whole paragraph because it just something stuck out to me. But uh, some of it, I, I maybe. Let's see. So, yeah, like um, you talked about, I don't want to. We're, we were ending, so I don't want to start over, but you talked about like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That sense that everything is a rerun. Yeah. Even e- including your life. So, like I said, that's a, a kind of small, it's a very simple sentence. But to me, like I highlighted it and I start it because it's terrifying to me that um, if there's any element of truth to that, which I'm I'm about to turn 40 in a couple of months and I still... Like I said, I'm not convinced that I'm not in the Hernandez show. You might be. Um, yeah, and you're therefore you're a part of it. That's cool. So. I'm, I haven't gotten any royalty checks though. So can you just wink, like left, right, nose flare? If, if I'm not, yeah. Uh, but I, I still have those thoughts. Cool. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I I still have those thoughts. So to me, it's like, you know, it takes a lot to scare someone i think or scare a seasoned horror right a reader is gonna it's gonna take a lot to scare them but to put that little seed of doubt in their mind again something i haven't felt for 
a while, I'm like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. that was a pretty big fear of mine. So I thought you were very effective with those just very, you know, I wouldn't call them subtle, but they're very frank. Um, yeah. Maybe even like stream of consciousness from you. I'm not sure. And I didn't say Frank as like a shout out to the dog in the room. You, you did. Yeah. He, we all knew why you said it. Okay. But um, I think it's a, a fantastic collection. I think the, at sometimes you, it's necessary um, to see someone else's suffering, to know that you're not alone. Yeah. Um, and to, like I said, to commiserate that you persevered, you're a uh, successful 29 year old, I, all the stuff I said uh, about you and, um, you know, look, look at all you came from. So I know um, Indiana Death Song is a lot of autobiographical. Um, so I think it's going to um, be effective for people that read it and maybe had a similar experience. Well, thank you. I'm glad you read it. I'm glad you connected with it. I'm glad we did this episode. And I don't know how to end it other than a rap battle. You have to uh, promote some of your shit now. You just did this awesome hosting gig. What do you have going on? Um, uh, you know, I have I have hopes. I have stuff that's out there. Only promote it in rhyme. Uh, what rhymes with? Okay. Um, <laughs> I am not prepared for this. You see I, how I terrifying can't... it is? It's fucking terrifying. To suddenly be yep. put on the spot. The rhyme. <laughs> no, actually, when you said that, I understood it. Not that I ever feared it would happen to me. It's just like, yeah, if that, yeah. Uh, I could, I could see it happening. Um, all that um, writing talent goes out the window when, yeah, you know, someone's two inches from your face. Can't um, so, I'm LP Hernandez. I think I said I'm a. a uh, geographically close to Max, as I said, but uh, um, I've got a couple things out there. Stargazers came out last year. I have a couple collections. Dreadful with Velox, The Rat King, which I released on my own, and uh, more short stories coming out this year, working on some longer stuff, and a sequel to Stargazers. We'll see where that goes. Have you considered changing the collection to The Rap King? I, you know, that's, that's coming up. Um, but okay. <laughs> You and I are going to have to write it together and then yes. perform it together. So the rap kings, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, how can folks find you online? Uh, LP Hernandez on Twitter. And I have dabbled in other stuff, TikTok. Um, I have a website too, which I, I, I very frequently or very infrequently post on only when other, when good stuff happens to me. Um, yeah. So that's lphernandez.com. Cool. Uh I think we we can just end it with that. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to plug my social media. Anyone listening to this probably already knows. And plus, it feels strange. I'm not used to doing the being on this side. Yeah. Yeah. I already said enough good stuff about you. Yeah. Uh, Ghoulish, Ghoulish Fest is coming up. How about that? Yeah. Ghoulish Book Fest, April uh, something. Uh, 15th, 15th, and 16th. Three days this time. One day, middle than last. How do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, rap battle Saturday. I'll be there. To we'll be doing a rap battle. I, uh, I have a wedding on Saturday, and I assume the wedding will also be a rap battle. Okay. Yeah. Whoever, whoever wins uh, gets million. <laughs> That'd be... Uh, not responsible. Okay. Um, I guess that's it. All right. Well, thank you for letting me host. It was really fun.
spooky. Die, spooky. <laughs> Rest in peace, Max. <laughs> <laughs>